to the slide here. So Torben or TMA, as I'm going to be referring to him uh, throughout these slides, uh, presents what I think is a super nice overview of, um, of a number of, let's say, uh, uh, changes in the setup or the framework of how fiscal policy is conducted in Denmark or has been conducted in Denmark for, for, quite, for now some decades. Uh, a few of them, I don't want to uh, remind all of you of all of Torben's points from the morning session, but, but some of the takeaways was that fiscal policy has become in Denmark more stability oriented with a stronger focus on, on these medium term plans, the fiscal space that Torben was, was explaining, and also the focus on fiscal sustainability. And, uh, and in contrast with, with less emphasis on, on micromanaging or fine tuning the economy. Um, so I think uh, Tom tried to convey this idea, which I very much share, that uh, that in, 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 in normal times, let's say, it's optimal to just let automatic stabilizers do their job and then uh, reserve fiscal, sort of major fiscal interventions for uh, for very significant disturbances such as the global financial crisis or the, or the recent pandemic. Uh, so the two points I'm going to, or the, 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 the discussion that, that I'm going to present can be framed sort of in two uh, uh, parts. First, I'm going to try to uh, to add a qualifier to some of the statements that that Torben made. Uh, not to say that I that I really fully disagree, at least not on most parts, but just to to qualify a little bit here and there. And then, second, I thought this would be a good opportunity to discuss what's the what's the potential future for for fiscal stabilization in Denmark, also spurred by some of uh, of Torben's points. So the first qualifier that I wanted to uh, to push on was was this here. So Torben didn't really uh, emphasized as much in uh, in his presentation as much as he did in the in the paper. I thought uh, the, that that fiscal uh, automatic stabilizers have potentially become weaker over the over the last decades. And to 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 make this claim, Torben points to the fact, which is correct, that uh, that both marginal and participation tax rates have been reduced over the last thirty years, which is true. However, it's also true that sort of a common guideline for, for, for tax reforms in general in Denmark over these decades uh, has been to, to reduce rates uh, indeed, but also at the same time to broaden the tax base. And, uh, and one reflection of this is that the, the, the overall level of tax revenues to GDP has not, uh, has not been reduced, uh, at least by no, by no significant uh, number uh, over these uh, same decades. And it's not clear really that such reforms where, the, where, where tax rates are reduced, but, but the tax base is broadened, that this necessarily weaken or reduce automatic stabilizers. So I tried to, uh, to look at, at, at some evidence on this, and I know that the OECD uh, releases sort of regular computations of the cyclical uh, uh, elasticity of various components of the, of the budget balance, of the fiscal balance in, in member countries. Uh, the most recent I could find was the one from, from 2014. I wouldn't claim that this is necessarily the most recent one. It, it's possible that they have more updated numbers at OECD, but this was the most recent I could find. I tried to compare that to, to earlier releases, for example, the paper that was released in 2005. And uh, if, you, if you read carefully through these, there's also some... some uh, um, uh, they, in the, for example, the 2014 paper has uh, some updates with, with respect to the 2005 paper, and they always, or in many cases at least, they try to discuss what has led to these changes. And in the 2005 paper, they also try to look even further back in time. They find that, that automatic stabilizers in general were fairly stable from like the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, and then this price it out paper from 2014 seems to, seems to confirm this idea for, for yet another decade. In fact, it might even go for some components. It might even go in the opposite direction. I took here this example of, of corporate tax revenues. So, uh, so the, the way these guys compute the, the, the size of automatic stabilizers is really a bottom-up approach where they, where they look at, um, at, at each component of taxes and they see what's the, what's the uh, cyclical sensitivity of this component and they weigh that all together by how much this, this component makes up of total tax revenues. And for corporate taxes, they find that that uh, the elasticity of of, re of revenues, uh, of corporate tax revenues, has increased or almost doubled uh, over this uh, from from the 2005 release to the 2014 release. And they cite uh, a more cyclically responsive tax base, which which goes a little bit in the direction of what I was uh, anticipating before. That if you reduce tax rates, which has also happened in Denmark over this period of time, if you reduce the rate but broaden the base, 
it's not it's not uh, obvious that that the automatic stabilizer in general should should become smaller. So my takeaway from from reading these two papers was that there's not really any evidence or not much evidence that that at a general level that that automatic stabilizers have declined in Denmark. So I think it's in my view at least more evidence is needed before we can before we can draw this conclusion. I would say that it's not that that Torben has this as a super firm conclusion. He says there are some. Uh, some things that suggest this, but I just wanted to uh, to perhaps qualify that uh, that statement a little bit. Uh, but anyway, I agree with Torben that that uh, fiscal uh, automatic stabilizers are a good thing. So in that sense, it would just be good news if if uh, if they have actually not uh, if they've actually not weakened. Um, okay, so this would be my first point. Point uh, a second point that I wanted to make was uh, in regard to and here I'm very much in agreement with Torben. Uh, in regard to his to his uh, claim that fiscal stabilization is in real time is very very hard, and that data uncertainty is a significant uh, reason of the, for this, Tom had this illustration that he also showed us in the slides based on uh, the employment gap for 2023, um, uh, computed at various or estimated at various points in time over the last uh, year and a half. Now this is just based on one year, and, and in that sense it leaves room for a more systematic analysis. There are some more systematic analyses that look also across countries, and I think an interesting takeaway from that literature uh, is that um, fiscal policy across OECD countries tends to be tends to be countercyclical uh, based on real time data or ex ante data. So in that sense, fiscal policymakers um, have good intentions, uh, but ex post, it's often found that fiscal policy is actually e either pro cyclical or perhaps acyclical. Uh, once you use uh, final data, there's a couple of papers that have uh, of academic papers that have that have proposed this result, which I think is interesting. It'll be it'll be interesting to study this for the case of Denmark, um, and to also do this using more updated data. Now, here I couldn't resist the temptation of uh, of pointing back to a working paper that I wrote with a co-author almost a decade ago. What we did was we took a, a DSG model for the Danish economy. This was when I was working for the Danish Central Bank. We, we took a, a, an estimated DSG model for the Danish economy and we used a fiscal rule to stabilize output and inflation. Um, and then we studied what happened uh, ex ante versus ex post. And let me just show you one, uh, one uh, graph from that paper, which is this one here. Uh, so the, the blue bar, so this covers the period 2005 to 12, as you can see, so, so uh, an updated version would surely be interesting. The blue bars is, is our estimate of the actual fiscal effect, the fiscal effect that, that Tolton was speaking about, but this in this case coming out of our DSG model. What's really, what's really my, my focus here is the difference between the green and the red bars. So the, the red bars is the real-time version or the ex ante version of, of fiscal recommendation, and the green bars would be the would be the ex post. So this is based on uh, the the most recent, the 2013 data vintage, which was the most uh, recent we had available at the time. And so here you see, for example, that in the years 2010, 11, and 12, the red and the green bars are, are actually different signs. This is because this was a time where the Danish central bank. I think, uh, like any other central bank, or at least most other central banks, was uh, too optimistic in their uh, forecast for how quickly the, the the financial crisis would, or how quickly the economy would would move out of the global financial crisis and the Great Recession that followed. And so, based on on these projections, uh, if you were sitting in the fall of 2009 and you were to make using this model, but I think the result is not really model specific, but using this particular model here, you would. You would give an advice to policymakers that they should actually have a, a, um, a contractionary fiscal policy of something like a quarter of a percentage point, the red bar in, in 2010, so the, the the one that is computed in the fall of 2009. Whereas in the, using the ex post data, it turned out that the economy was was much weaker than anticipated, so that there would actually, in order to stabilize the economy, stabilize output and inflation, there would actually be a need. For uh, for an expansionary fiscal policy of something like one percentage point, uh, so this I think is interesting that that the fiscal uh, the side of the fiscal recommendation that one would give, and as I said, this comes out of this model, but I think you could get you could get make a similar analysis based on on a range of other models that would tell you that the fiscal recommendation in real time might sometimes be quite different, not just uh, in quantities, but also in terms of the sign uh, when compared to the final. Um, uh, to the final result that uh, that one would, or the final the, the advice that one would have given with the benefit of hindsight, let's put it that way. Um, 
Then I don't want to spend much time on the on, on COVID. Now, Torben didn't really speak much about the COVID experience in, in, in this paper. I should point out that he's done so uh, uh, more than once on other occasions, so it's certainly not meant as a criticism to him. Um, uh, what I think is worth pointing out here, uh, which really also flies uh, in the same direction as, what, as, as some of the points Torben was making, is that the COVID response of the Danish government was, was really an illustration of the benefits of the stability-oriented approach that's been taken in recent decades. I, I used to call this Nikolai Varman, the Danish Minister of Finance, uh, his draggy moment, because eventually you would see him uh, appearing on Danish media and television telling uh, everyone who would listen to him that, that, the Danish, that the Danish government would do whatever it takes to get the Danish economy safely through the pandemic. And this is, of course, something that was that was possible because of the of the fiscal stance that Denmark was uh, was having going into the pandemic. And I think this is useful uh, for for Paul uh, and other people at the Ministry of Finance to remind you know future policymakers that if you want to be the if you want to do like Nikolai Vam did in 2020, then you also need to um, to, to to save for a rainy day uh, in advance. Then I thought it would be interesting to take this occasion to speculate a little bit about what might be the um, the future for fiscal stabilization. So Torben's message in that regard was not particularly optimistic, one might say, because he was he was voicing some concerns that I share regarding the use of government consumption, uh, or for that matter, government investment, or for that matter, tax policies to use for discretionary stabilization. And so I think it's it's important that one can that one takes the time now before. Uh, before the next recession hits to actually consider what might be the type of fiscal stimulus that can be uh, recommended in the next recession, going beyond, of course, automatic stabilizers. And I think it's interesting to think of some unconventional policy tools that have received some interest both in, uh, either in recent research or uh, or recently in, in other countries. So I, I want to highlight uh, three options here. So cash transfers, Temporary uh, changes in the VAT rate, and then uh, and then a fiscal devaluation, which I'll get back to what I mean by. So first of all, cash transfers. I think here it's interesting, and Tom was was uh, was also discussing this. Five a minute. Yes, that's perfect. Uh, here's very interesting that Denmark essentially uh, got lucky in the last two very deep recessions. Tobin, uh, Tobin very clearly explained how the special <coughs> pension savings were released in 2009 and the, and the holiday savings in 2020. And what's interesting about these two cases is that they were they these money were not put aside with the idea that they would be released in a future recession. So so that's why I'm saying Denmark got lucky, or or, or that the government really by chance found itself in a situation at which at which in which it could stimulate private spending at no cost, or actually I should say at negative cost, because uh, because actually the government received some tax uh, some tax uh, receipts in this in this uh, regard. But of course, the, the relevant question that also Tolton was alluding to is what do we do next time? And of course, in theory, one could imagine doing this on a more systematic basis, having a more systematic recession saving, having people pay into that. I think that's in practice not a very good idea. I can come up with a number of reasons. Uh, one being the fact that, of course, uh, every, every, every household or every consumer's individual uh, unemployment risk is not fully correlated with that of uh, of the aggregate economy. So some people might find themselves saving for uh, recession savings at the aggregate level, but at the same time finding themselves unemployed and actually in need of that money, but but they can't access it because it would only be released in a, in a general recession. That would be one thing. There's also going to be obvious anticipation effects, and who knows uh, what might what that might do to uh, to the marginal propensity to spend this money. This might, this might I think, reduce the NPC such that uh, such that this might not be so effective after all. And also, I think this is probably going to be a fairly uh, fairly unpopular proposal uh, to make. So probably it also it's also not going to be a very politically feasible idea. I think a better case can probably be made for just making outright cash transfers. Um, from the government, which is much inspired by what the U.S. has done in, a, in essentially the last three recessions. So there's, uh, I refer here to one study by Parker and co-authors from 2013 that studied the, the stimulus checks that were paid out in the 2008 recession in the U.S. But there were similar uh, stimulus checks being sent both in the 2001 recession and, and during the pandemic. And also, we have a lot of, of recent evidence uh, from the from the academic literature of high marginal propensities to consume. This includes Denmark, but it's not uh, but it's not only the case for Denmark. 
And of course, this would require more fiscal space than than these lucky episodes that uh, that that occurred in the last two recessions. But uh, but as as uh, both Tolman and also Paul I think pointed out, there is a certain amount of fiscal space that that this would not necessarily be be infeasible. So that would be one option. Um, another option that I think is is interesting or especially intriguing from a theoretical viewpoint is that. Um, is that of reducing uh, temporarily the value added tax, the VAT, so as to effectively uh, induce households, consumers to bring for to bring consumption forward in time. This is really, uh, in theory, this works much like uh, like a monetary uh, like a reduction in in interest rates, like a monetary expansion, because effectively what what we do here is we we reduce the cost of of consuming today uh, as compared to consuming in the future. Now there's. This is something that doesn't only work in theory, it also works in practice, at least uh, that seems to be the case for Germany, which which did exactly such a thing. They reduced the VAT um, in the second half of 2020 as a response to the COVID pandemic. And there's a recent academic paper that tries to, to estimate these results, finding fairly large stimulative effects, especially on consumer durables, also semi-durables to a certain to a certain extent. Now, the obvious problem for Denmark is that we produce much fewer of those consumer durables than, Ger than Germany does. So there's a risk, as I put it here, that, that Denmark end up, uh, may end up stimulating the German or the Swedish economy. Now, uh, I like being on good terms with my neighbors, but of course, uh, it's not optimal to have the entire uh, fiscal stimulus, le stimulus leaked to, to other countries. So I think so. I think a relevant task would be to try and estimate, and this is something that could be done uh, uh, by policy um, institutions as much as researchers, try to estimate the amount of, of leakage that would be associated with such a policy, and preferably to try to do this before the uh, next recession hits. Uh, the final point I wanted to make is that I think Tom has some very nice points about uh, the challenge of targeting fiscal stimulus to certain sectors. And also some discussion that the optimal fiscal policy, and that really goes for stabilization policy in general, should be should be shock dependent. And this made me think, as often is the case uh, for research, this has made me think of some recent work that I've done myself um, in in this recent paper where we try where we use um, an open economy New Keynesian model. It's a two-sector model with tradable and non-tradable goods, and there's there's heterogeneous households in this model. And then we, we, we study what happens in, in response to foreign demand shocks. And in particular, we also study how domestic policies uh, may be designed to, to deal with such shocks. And one, one result that we, that we present is that fiscal devaluations may be a very uh, um, effective stabilization tool under a fixed exchange rate. What is a fiscal devaluation? Well, it can be implemented actually in different ways, but I think the most, the most straightforward way would be to increase the VAT and at the same time reduce the payroll tax, for that matter, implement an employment subsidy, so as to uh, partly tweak international relative prices and, and partly reduce the domestic cost of production. And what is the, the upshot here is that conventional fiscal policy tends to stimulate the domestic non-tradable sector, that's also what we find, but this happens at the expense of the tradable sector because a fiscal expansion and increasing government spending would appreciate the terms of trade, and this would uh, this would just aggravate the shortfall of demand or in demand for, for tradable domestic goods. Now, instead of fiscal devaluation actually uh, does effectively mimic a, a monetary expansion because it has the opposite effect on the terms of trade. It depreciates the terms of trade at the same time as stimulating the domestic economy through the, uh, through the reduction in payroll tax. So, uh, so we actually find that in absence of, a, of an independent monetary policy, which is exactly the case for for a country with a fixed exchange rate, or for that matter, countries uh, that are in a, a currency union. So Finland would be one example, of course, um, that in those cases, fiscal devaluation should perhaps be added to sort of to the standard fiscal policy toolkit because they actually uh, allow uh, the country to obtain much of the same effects that, that they would by uh, through a monetary expansion. That was really what I wanted to say. I think I already uh, expressed what's on this slide here. So let me just uh, thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we were able to hear from you. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I see Torben here as well. Uh, so hopefully he's been able to uh, listen in on all of this. So, Søren, if you can stop sharing, I yes. will um, 
start sharing my stuff and we are going to move to Norway. Our Norwegian author, Hans Holter, is here. And let me get the um, Let's see. We have done the lunch break. Yeah. Here we go. Hans, over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So this is uh, I wrote this jointly with uh, Anna Melissa Freira, who is a, a PhD student from Nova School of Business and Economics, but she has been visiting the University of Delaware and, and she takes an interest in Nordic countries and also in Norwegian uh, microdata. Um, so um, <clears throat> fiscal multipliers uh, appear to be vary greatly across uh, time and place. And uh, I think uh, now, uh, by now, the, there's uh, agreement in the academic literature that that there's no such thing as one fiscal multiplier, but it is uh, very instrument dependent, uh, but also uh, state dependent. It depends on the state of the economy, like business cycles, but also the income and wealth distribution. And, in a recent paper, so touch on the possible non-linearity of fiscal multipliers. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I've been myself contributing to uh, three papers on the well, two papers on the state dependence of fiscal multiplier, and then the last one on on size dependence. So, in in Brinka et al. Uh, 2016, then we we uh, argue that countries with higher wealth inequality have uh, larger fiscal multipliers in the in the context of of financing uh, an increasing government spending with a, a lump sum tax. Uh, but then in, in Brinka et al. 221, we <coughs> argue that um, the fiscal multipliers um, resulting from the fiscal consolidation programs after the financial crisis, their uh, countries with higher uh, income inequality have uh, have uh, larger fiscal multipliers in the in the context of, uh, of those uh, fiscal consolidations. And then finally, now in a new paper in 2023, then we we argue that uh, the um, the fiscal multiplier of uh, government spending is uh, increasing in the in the spending shock. So with uh, large positive shocks to government spending having the largest multipliers and and the large negative shocks the smallest multipliers. Um, so what we uh, what we do in uh, in our paper here is that we we first uh, inspect uh, some economic characteristics of the Nordic countries in uh, regards to these three papers that I've written. We focus in particular on the income and wealth distribution, but also on the, we also uh, have a look at taxes and government spending in the Nordic countries. And then we uh, uh, briefly review this uh, literature on uh, state and size dependence of uh, fiscal multipliers, and then we we discussed the implication for uh, fiscal policy uh, in the Nordic countries, and then we, we finish off by using the using some of the empirical results um, in uh, Brinka et al. 2021 to to get estimates uh, of fiscal multipliers in Nordic countries in the in the context of uh, fiscal consolidation programs. Uh, so what we what we find is that um, Nordic countries are, are characterized by high wealth inequality, but low income inequality, and this is likely to imply that there are many low wealth <laughs> borrowing constrained consumers in Nordic countries. And the literature says that the literature that we will review says that in economies with many low wealth consumers, then the labor supply response to current income shock is uh, high, but the labor supply response to future income shocks is low. And this will um, also affect fiscal multipliers so that economies with many low wealth consumers, then there should be large fiscal multipliers from programs that change the current income of the consumers because then their labor supply moves a lot, but there should be uh, low fiscal multipliers from programs that change future income because then their labor supply uh, moves uh, less. <clears throat> um, and uh, for this final exercise, then we find that since uh, Nordic countries have low uh, income inequality, then uh, uh, depending on which measure income inequality we use, we find that 
the multiplier from fiscal consolidation in Nordic countries vary from 0.98 to 1.47 compared to an average of 1.20 to 1.77 for European countries. So that will be in, in line with this uh, this uh, theory. <clears throat> so first, have a look at uh, fiscal policy uh, in the Nordic countries. The government spending as um, as a fraction of, uh, of GDP. So we can see that uh, here also compared to the US, you see that. Uh, government spending is higher as a fraction of, of GDP in uh, in Nordic countries, and we see that there are uh, quite uh, uh, some. Uh, oops, uh, I was trying to. Uh, point. Okay, we, we can see that there's quite some uh, some ev evidence of uh, spending increasing around the financial crisis in 2008, and then. Um, uh, also, around the COVID pandemic, there is uh, significant jumps in uh, in government spending. Um, so, yeah, some stylized facts for the Nordic countries. Uh, as was mentioned earlier here, one, uh, one uh, fact uh, about Nordic countries is this dual, dual income tax uh, system, which combines uh, flat tax on capital income with a, a progressive uh, labor income tax. So, um, 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 yeah, uh, labor income is taxed uh, at a very high and progressive rates, and uh, um, cap uh, capital income is taxed uh, at a flat rate. The whole high, I guess it depends a bit on on um, the source. There's some variation, and we, we are going to show you one, one source for the, the Size of the capital income tax. Uh, so uh, here, um, um, here we have some uh, measure of measures of uh, of uh, tax policies in the Nordic countries. You can see that uh, they have uh, a very uh, uh, high consumption tax compared to the US. At least the EU average is. Is 23 percent. Uh, so these average tax measures come from yeah from a paper by Trabant and Ulig. So it depends a bit uh, which source. So compared to the capital tax measures that you saw earlier today, this is a, a method that at least tries to take into account uh, also corporate taxes. Like your taxes are are uh, capital taxes are applied in several stages. First on corporation, next on uh, on the shareholders uh, or the to the dividends or capital gains. Uh, so then, um, then um, capital taxes are, are still uh, si sizable, but um, but they, but they are supposed to be flat, which is not, yeah, uh, which is, makes it still a bit different from the labor income tax. As the Nordic countries have very high average uh, labor income taxes. Then in a in a, a paper with uh, with uh, Dirk Kruger and Sergei Stepanchuk, I have uh, estimated uh, um, uh, pro progressivity. Uh, Indexes uh, for labor income taxes in a number of OECD countries. So, uh, based on those estimations, uh, uh, Nordic countries also tend to have um, very uh, high uh, income tax progressivity, uh, in particular compared to the US, but also most Nordic countries are above, above the EU uh, average. Um, so then, uh, yeah, some. Uh, I guess the table has gotten a little bit uh, shifted here. Uh, um, so yeah, here I guess the yeah intent was probably to have not 220 and 221, but to also have a an earlier year. But um, this is like the uh, yeah, the total tax burden uh, as calculated by uh, this is uh, I think OCD data. Uh, so then um, <clears throat> also Nordic the Nordic countries have a high tax burden uh, as uh, compared to GDP, uh, much higher than. Than uh, US and also also higher than the OECD uh, average. Um, so then, um, yeah, so Nordic countries are uh, committed to com committed to reduce uh, income inequality through this uh, progressive uh, labor income taxes. Uh, but uh, they present a, a distinctive um, economic profile that they have. We're going to have a very low income inequality, but relatively high wealth inequality. Um, 
So, um, <clears throat> here we have some measures of uh, of income and wealth inequality. For example, the Gini coefficient of income and then say the y twenties, the y uh, the y twenties, the share of the uh, income uh, received by the top twenty percent, and y eighty would be the share received by <clears throat> by the um, uh, bottom. Uh, <clears throat> Bottom, um, uh, maybe, maybe that's the bottom, yeah, maybe it's probably the bottom 20 and then it's uh, the top 10 to the, compared to the bottom 10 or by 90, it's like that. Uh, so, so then uh, uh, you can see it. So, in terms of the income Gini coefficient, that the Nordic countries have uh, quite low income Genies uh, compared to the US in particular, but also below the EU average. Uh, but in terms of wealth genius, uh, there is more. There's more variation. So a couple of countries have a wealth genie that is uh, below the EU average, but uh, particularly like uh, Denmark and Sweden have quite high, uh, high wealth genies. Uh, so, so that is uh, then a, a contrast there between income and wealth uh, inequality. Um, so. Uh, then uh, this um, uh, yeah so so yeah you can say low income genius may may reflect that this progressive tax policy is, is working to um, push push together uh, income distribution of course other factors in Nordic countries such as um, such as uh, unions may also play a role there uh, for for uh, for uh, compressing the income. Income uh, distribution. Uh, then this is spe <laughs> just a speculation that it could be a relationship between uh, high wealth genius and this flat tax on on capital uh, compared to the progressive <laughs> tax on labor. But I, I haven't done I haven't done any research on on that. Um, but also very generous pension systems in the Nordic countries. So there is some research showing that uh, generous pension systems lead to high wealth inequality because reduces the incentives to save for low earners uh, so um, so that, that that that's one at least one uh, effect of these types of fiscal policies on uh, on wealth wealth inequality um, so here's then uh, we get to the first um, the first paper here so uh, uh, that's the Brinka Brinka at all uh, 216 there we uh, we uh, first borrow Data and methodology from a paper by Ilsetsky et al. and just group countries into two groups: those with with uh, above average uh, wealth genius and those with below. And we show that the fiscal uh, we, run, uh, we borrow the codes and the methodology from Ilsetsky et al. We show that um, in an S, uh, SVAR, the fiscal multiplier from uh, uh, in countries with high wealth inequality is uh, high and significant, uh, but not in countries with low well inequality uh, and then we this, this is just like a stylized factor or, or motivation in that paper so we show that uh, this could be rationalized by the type of fiscal experiment where an increased increase in uh, government spending is financed by uh, a lump sum tax today uh, so then that changes um, that that change changes consumers current income uh, so then, uh, to show that we, we take a, a standard uh, neoclassical macro model, uh, old G model, with uninsurable uh, labor income risk, uh, and we calibrate it to data from a bunch of uh, from the number of OECD countries, uh, including uh, characteristics such as the income and wealth distribution, taxes and debt, and we we study uh, then an increase. Uh, in government spending finance by one one period lump sum tax, and what we find is that the countries that had high wealth inequality they also have a larger fiscal multiplier, um, and that is because uh, in those countries with high wealth inequality there were uh, a lot of um, low wealth or credit constrained or close to credit constrained consumers that have a a larger labor supply response uh, to the lump sum tax, and um, uh, so this would uh, this uh, rational, rationalizes the 
the finding of a, a larger fiscal multiplier um, in the, in the context of that that fiscal uh, experiment. Uh, so in a, in a over multi country exercise with 15 OCD countries, then um, uh, we, we find uh, yeah, and I know, yeah, just another finding is also that the fiscal multipliers depend on the on the capital to output uh, ratio, and so you find that um, uh, there's a correlation in over exercise uh, between the, after we after we calibrate the model to all these different characteristics, then uh, then we get a, a correlation between wealth inequality and the fiscal size of the fiscal multiplier of 0 0.62. But then the the um, um, the relationship between the KY ratio and the uh, and the um, um, fiscal multiplier is uh, is negative and correlation is minus 0 0.68. So so that that is more that is coming from um, the effect of uh, in a closed economy KY is uh, um, <clears throat> de decreasing decreasing the real interest rate. Um, so. Uh, um, yeah, so what we find with respect to wealth inequality is that if an, we increase the one standard deviation increase in the wealth genie, then we get a 17% uh, larger uh, fiscal multiplier in over, over model uh, exercise in uh, the Brinka et al. 2016 paper. Um, so then we have the, um, uh, the Brinka et al. Uh, 2031 paper. Uh, so there, that paper is uh, <coughs> saying that the um, recessive impacts of, uh, of fiscal consolidation programs are are stronger when uh, income inequality is uh, is higher. And uh, so that paper first started with some empirical evidence or empirical motivation. One is coming from the paper by uh, Blanchard and Lee, 2013. Um, so there we um, they, they run a regression. Um, they look at the impact of fiscal consolidations on um, on uh, fiscal multipliers. Uh, but um, uh, we, we find that um, yeah they, they also they also found that uh, so what they what they did was to look at the IMF's forecasts and then uh, uh, see by how much the IMF. Uh, um, um, under the IMF tended to underestimate the uh, impact of fiscal consolidation programs. So they they looked at uh, the, how much the IMF had underestimated the effect of the uh, um, um, fiscal consolidation programs. So what we show is that uh, this forecast error is very closely depends on um, on um, hmm? okay. oh, a forecast error is correlated with the uh, with uh, measures of income inequality. Uh, so we we augment their regression with different measures of income inequality and in interaction term between fiscal consolidation and income inequalities. And for example, we find that uh, one standard deviation increase in the uh, Y10 to Y90 uh, income inequality measure would, would lead the IMS to un IMF to underestimate the, the fiscal multiplier in that country by 66%. Uh, and then we have another uh, empirical study by I'll see now at all where we where we also look at the effect of income inequality and we find that uh, yeah some some measures of income inequality uh, augmenting augmenting the regressions with uh, some measures of income inequality leads to uh, much larger fiscal multipliers in the case of Y25 to Y75 led to 240 <laughs> percent uh, increase in the in the fiscal uh, multiplier uh, so that's like the Empirical motivation comes just from kind of copying uh, or reproducing other studies, but introducing uh, measures of income inequality. Um, oops, uh, yeah, some shifting of the slides here. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, then uh, <clears throat> this, um, we, um, but then to rationalize this behavior, we um, uh, <clears throat> develop an OG economy with uh, heterogeneous agents and. Um, uh, calibrated to um, to match um, the distribution of income and wealth, uh, taxes, and a few other characteristics of um, OECD uh, economies. Then we study uh, fiscal consolidations. 
um, means the reductions uh, of government debt. Uh, they can be financed either through reduction austerity, like reductions in G government spending, or an increase in uh, in uh, labor income tax uh, uh, TL. Um, so, uh, um, and we can see that. So, if a fiscal a fiscal consolidation uh, program, where um, um, debt is reduced through reducing uh, G, uh, what happens then uh, in the long run? Then uh, the capital will be higher because uh, debt falls, uh, and then. Uh, Cons uh, consumers will, in instead of all the capital and debt, so the marginal product of labor will be larger, and wages will be higher in the in the future. Um, and then, um, uh, however, so this is like a future a future income shock, and uh, the credit constraint agents and agents with low wealth, they have a um, uh, lower intertemporal elasticity of substitution. They do not consider changes to their. Uh, Lifetime budget. They consider all the changes today. So um, then uh, the uh, economies with many credit constraint agents uh, will be less responsive to this uh, uh, fiscal consolidation programs. Uh, we can also change that through increasing labor income taxes today. Uh, that is less uh, theoretically uh, clean because um, increased labor tax today. There's a negative uh, income effect in the negative uh, income effect in the future on uh, labor supply because uh, in the future uh, taxes can be lower because there is less debt and also uh, wages will be higher because there is uh, more capital in the economy um, and uh, there's also a negative substitution effect on labor supply today. Uh, leisure becomes relatively uh, less expensive and increases the labor income tax, but then finally there's a, a positive income effect in the short run. It turns out that effect uh, one and three uh, dominates uh, so that uh, <coughs> labor supply is uh, is falling and output is falling in the short run when, uh, when we start this fiscal consolidation. And then uh, low wealth households uh, respond less. Uh, they will respond less to the first and, and third effect, but more to the second effect. But the second effect seem to be very small compared to the first and third effect. Uh, so then also also here to this type of experiment and um, uh, constrained individuals respond less than unconstrained individuals. And finally, then economies that have uh, low uh, income risk no, or have more income risk, uh, they have more precautionary savings. Uh, agents will locate themselves further away from the borrowing limit. Uh, and there'll be fewer low wealth agents when there's a lot of income risk. and. Uh, will lead to a more elastic labor supply in the context of these two types of fiscal consolidation programs and then a larger fiscal multiplier in a country with more income inequality. Um, so yeah, here's just a graph, I guess it's from the model exercise. So, so we uh, vary, although we, we calibrated the model to all these different statistics from the uh, from the different countries, but including the variance of, of log wages, then we can we get them. Uh, the size of the fiscal multiplier is uh, so here. I guess we one multiplier is positive because if we define the multiplier as the the change in G over the uh, the change in uh, no the change in Y over the change in G, but in this one we we define it as the change in. Um, in uh, um, uh, output uh, over the change in tax revenues, but 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 the size the size effect is the same in these two graphs that the multiplier is larger when uh, when uh, there is a higher variance of, of uh, log wages uh, to get a larger a larger size of the fiscal multiplier. Um, so that's in in over model, so that that goes in the same direction as the empirical evidence from uh, Blanche and Alain Lé and uh, Alcina et al. Uh, finally, there is uh, the question is uh, if um, fiscal multipliers are, uh, are non-linear. Uh, so um, in uh, Brinkite all 2023, we, we argue that, uh, that uh, fiscal multipliers are uh, increasing in the size of the 
government spending shock with more expansionary government spending shocks generating larger larger multiplier and more contractionary uh, shocks generating smaller multiplier. Uh, this also paper also start with uh, some evidence of that these non-linearities from Alcina et al. and also from a uh, paper by Ramian Subari, which we um, augment with like uh, I guess a um, quadratic term in the in the uh, size of the spending shock. Um, then uh, uh, so we, we find out that uh, a neoclassical uh, if we try to study this question in a neoclassical uh, macro model with uh, incomplete markets and heterogeneous agents, which we calibrate to the US economy, and then we, we study the size dependence of fiscal multipliers uh, result, resulting from um, uh, increases in government spending, either financed through debt or or finance through a, a lump sum tax. Uh, and, uh, so, so we have um, a decrease in the a decrease in G uh, uh, coming from um, <coughs> uh, or um, le leading to a, a reduction in in debt. Um, that will be a, um, a positive shock uh, to future income. Um, and this will um, this is going to reduce uh, the savings today, which is then going to increase uh, the mass of agents that are at or close the the borrowing constraint. And so, uh, the larger such a shock, then the the larger is the movement of the wealth distribution. The more agents. Uh, will uh, move their wealth position uh, close to closer to the borrowing constraint, and so <clears throat> given that low wealth households react less to shocks um, to future income, then also simultaneously their their uh, labor supply uh, elasticity will uh, <clears throat> will fall less. Um, so therefore, the 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 larger the larger negative. Uh, Larger negative shock you have, the lower labor supply elasticity you will have to this future income shock, and, the, and the, uh, also then the, the smaller the fiscal multiplier, and the, you have the opposite for a, a large positive shock to G. Then uh, agents will uh, save more; they will be more forward-looking, and the labor supply uh, elasticity will be larger, and the fiscal multiplier will be larger. Um, and uh, so that that is the that is the mechanism in case of the uh, in case of a uh, change in G that is uh, financed through either decreasing or increasing uh, debt. Uh, so you can see that we find um, uh, here here's like the the type of pattern that we get in the here's like you can have a, a plus from minus ten percent to Plus 10% change uh, in uh, okay. I think it should, uh, it should probably say uh, there's probably a change in G, change in not the change in debt, but change in G as a, as a percent of uh, output, and then the the fiscal uh, multiplier on the y axis. We get this type of, of non-linear uh, fiscal multiplier depending on the on the size uh, of the fiscal shock. Uh, also, if you chose to finance. Uh, you could also uh, finance the decrease in G uh, with an increase in in transfers. Uh, then um, a positive shock uh, to current income, uh, and, uh, like a, a, a positive positive uh, uh, transfer. Uh, would then induce an increase in savings today uh, and decrease the mass of agents. At or close to the borrowing constraint, uh, but then given that low wealth um, low wealth households uh, react more, um, the low wealth households react more to um, to uh, shocks to current income. <clears throat> so then, um, and you get uh, if you finance the uh, change in G in um, in this way, um, also get. Um, a large, a large negative shock 
to G gives less credit constraint consumers and less uh, less um, <clears throat> um, uh, and lower labor supply elasticity and a smaller fiscal multiplier, while a <clears throat> um, positive shock to G would give um, more low wealth households, a larger labor supply elasticity and a larger fiscal multiplier. So also this also this experiment uh, creates this type of, of pattern uh, with increasing uh, increasing fiscal multi multiplier that's increasing in in the size of the government spending shock. Uh, so, the, when this, um, so say that this key mechanism, which relies on differential response of uh, labor supply across the wealth distribution um, and movements of that same distribution, that also so the first two papers we just use like uh, neoclassical macro models. Um, uh, this paper also we also try this mechanism in a hank. Hank model that has uh, sticky sticky prices and um, um, and new Keynesian uh, new Keynesian elements and so same mechanism works uh, also also survives in the Hank model uh, and um, in some cases uh, in some cases the nonlinearities are so much larger in the, in the Hank model in particular that was true in the case of the debt financed um, experiment. Um, then, uh, <clears throat> so then, what's the implications of all of this for fiscal policy in the Nordic countries? So, uh, we've seen that fiscal multipliers are affected by the income and wealth inequality through their effect on the credit constrained consumers. Um, of course, this may depend a little bit on the on the underlying forces driving income and wealth distributions. Uh, so, if high at least this, um, if um, um, <clears throat> high income inequality is driven at least in partial by uh, uh, by income risk, then uh, higher uh, risk will lead to less uh, credit constrained consumers in the economy. And in the case of calibrating this uh, Nordic countries, uh, not calibrating all the all the countries uh, to the wealth distribution and one driver of the wealth distribution was pension systems then but the largest driver is was uh, heterogeneity in uh, in discount factors so if you let this be a, a driver of of income inequality and then it's true that economies with larger wealth inequality gets many more uh, credit constrained consumers uh, so then if one buys that that economies with uh, high wealth inequality has many credit constrained consumers but economies with High income inequality has fewer credit constrained consumers. Then the implication is that in Nordic countries there'll be many credit constrained consumers because they have the combination of low uh, uh, wealth inequality, not uh, high wealth inequality, but low uh, income risk or income inequality. Uh, and so we have also verified this. So in a, we have a table in over right top where we look at the a little bit more deciles of. Uh, uh, wealth and there we have Sweden and Finland so the, the country with the most in that in uh, in those data the country with the most low wealth consumers is Sweden in a, a group of OECD countries and Finland is also below the or have more low wealth consumers than the average um, so there seems to be indication that Nordic countries have many uh, low wealth consumers and uh, <clears throat> uh, so then, uh, there are yeah, many low wealth and credit constrained consumers. Uh, then, uh, okay, this is uh, uh, yeah. So the impl implication of that is that uh, uh, let's see, let's see, is that my okay? Maybe I forgot one point. So the main the main point then, uh, if you have many credit constrained consumers in the Nordic countries, then. Uh, the fiscal multiplier should be fiscal multiplier for programs that change consumers' current income should be high, but the fiscal multiplier from programs that change consumers' future income should be low. So that's the that's a lesson uh, from that. And so then, in terms of, uh, in the context of this uh, Blanchard and Lee uh, regressions, uh, then we have. Uh, here we have just used uh, income inequality measures for the Nordic. Countries and in uh, used over regression coefficients, as uh, so depending on which uh, income inequality measure you use, then 
you get uh, different estimates for uh, the fiscal multiplier in the Nordic countries. These are the multipliers from fiscal consolidation programs after a great recessions, uh, recession. So this will be quite, I guess, quite sizable estimates of fiscal multipliers. Maybe m many studies find smaller multipliers than this, depending on the on the context and uh, and so on. So, but uh, I guess the lesson here is that Nordic countries have have low uh, income inequality, then, then we get below uh, average uh, fiscal multipliers. Uh, and I guess this these regressions is just a con uh, augmenting uh, regression with income inequality. We didn't even say anything about wealth inequality. So both of those, both the high wealth inequality and the low low um, uh, income inequality uh, should uh, create smaller multipliers from fiscal consolidations because those are changes to future income. Um, so um, while policies that change current income, we would expect the Nordic <coughs> countries to have large, uh, large fiscal multipliers. Uh, so yeah, that is also the conclusion that um, the Nordic countries have uh, Low income and wealth inequality, and um, this duality uh, should lead to many low wealth and uh, credit constrained consumers uh, that will respond strongly to uh, future and uh, 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 current income changes, respond less to future <coughs> income changes, and just the, the fiscal multipliers um, will be a large uh, for programs that. Uh, uh, increase consumers' current income, but low for programs that uh, increase uh, consumers' uh, consumers' future income. So for example, uh, pro a program that changes direct uh, transfer will have probably a large effect in the Nordic uh, countries. Uh, uh, yes. <coughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> No, then we will have. Did you have time? Oh, you look just yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, two things, perhaps two questions. Uh, so in Denmark, I would guess that at least part of the wealth inequality is coming from uh, people studying. Uh, so uh, when you study, you can actually. You're not borrowing constraint too much because you can take uh, loans against future income, um, and then the pension system. So, so that's a bit in contrast to what you were saying. That at least that's, that uh, the that, that would be my guess uh, of of being uh, financially constrained. Uh, that's one. And then the, the second was that you say that uh, you find that that uh, a large uh, Fiscal expansion has a larger fiscal impact. Um, so I'm just thinking that I think in lottery studies, you typically find that if you have a huge lottery uh, uh, gain, then you actually spread it out and the, the, the LTC is smaller. Uh, so, so how does that compare? Yeah, I think uh, so. The first question. Uh, so that, that's, I think, um, a general problem with. Uh, Case studies of uh, borrowing constraints is that um, you, you you don't really know uh, much about the credit market. Do people have the ability to to borrow? Uh, so it's um, it, it's uh, mostly uh, what what you can observe is mostly uh, uh, the asset holdings of people like quantiles. Uh, so now I guess yeah, studying. I think it's probably so. These things are for. Uh, Looking at OECD countries, right? So probably quite similar. I would assume with uh, student loans and so on. Probably quite similar across those countries. Uh, so, so perhaps, perhaps uh, study. But, but, but so, so that that's that's a, a, a general problem that we don't we don't know um, if people can borrow. Uh, it's like having negative assets. It may still be that you have a credit card that you can borrow. So that that's a, a problem that all all such, <laughs> such studies would. <laughs> Would have to uh, deal with, uh, but or have to, um, uh, but but, uh, but still, yeah. Uh, so I guess the student population is just, uh, I guess, some fraction. So I think, like in in Sweden, I think we probably found something that 
more than like 30 or 30% of the population has negative belt, for example. So it's like very, it's a huge uh, negative uh, belt uh, position in, uh, in, in Sweden um, in, in, in our data. So, so I think, yeah. Um, but but uh, yeah, so the other question, uh, exactly. So, so if you win a large uh, lottery winning, uh, then I think, um, uh, so then you'll, uh, that is like a large, it's like a large transfer, uh, and uh, and so you you'll increase your your savings uh, from the uh, from the transfer, and then you'll, you'll remove yourself uh, from the borrowing constraints. So that, uh, gradually, as the gradually as your lottery winning um, uh, becomes larger, your labor supply response uh, becomes uh, to a current to the current transfer becomes uh, smaller because uh, you get the, you get the larger and larger. A transfer, you you save more and more, and you you are suddenly no longer borrowing constraint, but you are you go then to be a um, a forward-looking non uh, a forward-looking consumer exactly that saves <laughs> saves part of the income. So so as as you remove yourself from the borrowing constraint, yes, then it will be fully rational to save a lot uh, a lot of the of the lottery winnings. Uh, yes, yes. That's, uh... Thank you, Hans. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move then to our discussants. Uh, Joe. Yes, will there be one or two comments? There's two of you. Okay. Yes. Sure. We have Jord and Johan. So let's me see. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah, so I work at the at the Norwegian Ministry of Finance. So but nothing of what I'm going to say now represents the ministry. It's all it's all on me. Uh, so I have three perspectives first, just from a policy point of view. Uh Norway has a special situation, as you know. So we have uh, are lucky enough to have this uh, large uh, fund that we can spend out of every year. Uh, this is the annual takeout rate from the, the fund, and this is the size of the takeout from the fund relative to the mainland economy. So, okay, over time we take out, we used to have a guideline of 4%. Now the guideline says that we should target 3% of the fund. Uh, with the enormous growth in the fund, that constitutes a larger and larger share of or GDP in Norway. So for the budget proposal next year, we the, the, the budget proposal um, aims at spending or a uh, takeout that uh, amounts to more than 10% of, of mainland GDP. In that context, uh, fiscal multipliers are of first order importance. So I sort of really welcome the topic of uh, today's workshop. And uh, we, we were trying to, our job, my job is to try to help the politicians uh, uh, set some the limits to, to spending. One thing is to follow the guideline of 3%. So in the budget proposal for next year, they plan to spend 2.7% of the fund. So it's within the, the limit. But then uh, it's also really important in the fiscal guideline to, to look at, the, at the, or try to contribute to, to smoothing out the economic fluctuations. So when, when um, uh, looking at the budget proposal, we try to assess the impact it has on GDP. So we need to. So we worry about fiscal multipliers all the time. Uh, so in the red uh, circle here, you uh, see the GDP impact that we estimated for the budget proposal uh, for next year. So um, the budget impulse measures how much extra we take out of the fund in next year compared to this year. So we take out 0.4% of GDP extra next year. But since when we filter it through the models and uh, our assumed fiscal multipliers, it amounts to close to zero impact on, on GDP. Uh, so figuring out whether we have the right multipliers or not should be super important for us. Um, <laughs> if everything had a multiplier of one, that these numbers should be the same. But so this reflects that we on average have multipliers uh, far below one. For spending, the multiplier is close to one. For transfers and taxes, the, the first year multiplier is quite small. OK, so, so we need to care about this. Um, and also, yeah, I can skip that. Um, so what's this paper? Uh, I have two slides on that before I uh, have some questions or remarks to the paper. Uh, so as uh, Hans now um, in a nice way told us, so the, the, the paper is a nice overview of selected research on fiscal multipliers. I didn't know this literature super well before I started reading the paper, so it was a nice occasion to, to get up to speed speed on that. Uh, so it primarily focuses on these three papers that, that Hans uh, uh, is a co-author on. Uh, common to all three papers is that they, 
we'll present some stylized empirical facts on physical multipliers, and then show how a neoclassical heterogeneous agent model might explain those. So that's sort of what you get in all three papers. And then this summary paper, then, as, as Hans showed us, it also discusses what this literature can say about the size of physical multipliers in the Nordics. And they, they put um, numbers for the Nordic countries uh, with regards to their levels of income inequality into a regression from that 2021 paper uh, uh, to, to conclude that low income inequality in Nordics could lead to small multipliers. Small, there's a fairly large multipliers, but smaller than, than if inequality was higher uh, from fiscal consolidation programs. That's the, 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 the application at the end of the paper. The key mechanism, as Hans described, but let me just emphasize that, in the models uh, they look at, is that you have, when you have a change in, in fiscal policy accompanied by a big labor supply effect, that's when you have large fiscal multipliers. So in the, 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 this class of models, all multiplier variation is driven by variations in how strongly labor supply responds. Uh, and then that depends that is not sort of a given. It depends on, on the, how the fiscal experiment is designed. When they have a balanced budget fiscal stimuli, uh, so that you increase spending while uh, if, uh, and finance that with higher lumps of taxes immediately, labor supply responds the most for those who are credit constrained. Whereas when they have a fiscal consolidation, it's those who are not credit constrained that respond the most with their labor supply. So that's why you get this this uh, uh, by like difference between uh, the, the the different uh, uh, the different uh, uh, fiscal experiments, and then also then the different conclusions. So when you have this balanced budget fiscal stimuli, it's when you have high wealth inequality and thereby many credit constraints that you will expect a large labor supply effect. While with the consolidation program, it's when you have low wealth inequality and few credit constrained households. So that's what. So the key, as long as you understand this slide, you sort of understand all, almost all of the three papers uh, uh, that the, that are summarized. Uh, so then my my uh, remarks or comments will sort of rotate around uh, uh, whether um, uh, how you could, should think about this kind of mechanism in the Nordics and and whether it is the right focus to 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 have models with this mechanism as the driving force. So the, the first question is maybe a little bit technical, but nevertheless uh, uh, relevant to raise. What is a more relevant experiment, and how does it matter? Because what you see is that in the in the it's crucial exactly how you set up in the models exactly how you set up the fiscal experiment. Um, and and uh, for this fiscal stimuli, you have sort of lump sum taxation. Which is a very theoretical <laughs> assumption, um, and you have sort of the laboratory to look at more advanced. You look at labor taxation in, in all of the other papers, but still, it's very it's a it's a laboratory that allows you to have a more fine grained um, uh, way to finance the spending, and and you also in the paper uh, refer to like a, a fiscal stimuli uh, using transfers, uh, which is then. You would think that a uh, uh, sufficiently um, smart uh, government would not finance transfer a transfer program with a lump sum tax to sort of defeat the purpose of it. Uh, so it would be interesting to know in these kinds of models uh, how how the the implications so of the link between inequality and and price matters or changes if you have a more realistic way of financing it. So my hunch is that if you had sort of assumed that more of the, the tax burden hits the rich, you would sort of see also with fiscal stimuli and uh, lower multipliers with low income inequality. But that's just a, a hunch. But like so seeing some more, uh, having at least some some kind of uh, reflection of of, uh, of that would be would be nice. Question two, is the distinctiveness of the Nordics uh, exaggerated? Uh, you were a bit more uh, um, careful to emphasize this uh, in the presentation now, but 
in the paper sort of states that the Nordics have low income inequality and high wealth inequality. So these are just numbers from from the paper, or at least one of the papers. In that case, said file is said this one. Decided to just look at the numbers for all the countries that you have have income and wealth Gini for, and the red dots are in the Nordics. And clearly, so income inequality is uh, low in the Nordics. But I don't really. <laughs> but it's it's really hard to to be convinced by the the the, the, the fact that the wealth inequality is. So wealth inequality is more spread out in the Nordics, but like the, the sentence when you read the paper and you're looking to trying to be critical, it's hard to, to read past the sentence. Uh, Nordic countries have low income inequality and high wealth inequality and not be a bit annoyed by that when, when this is what it looks like. And I, I haven't double checked other sources or so I don't really know the quality of the data or whatever, but this was just a part that annoyed me a little bit. There are some qualifying sentences. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as you see, at least the Denmark and Sweden have among the highest. Uh, yeah, yeah, and naturally. Uh, but I think. Uh, so more out, so, yeah. Yeah. So, but I think a way you sort of. Yeah, but I think a, a reason you sort of state that a bit, uh, maybe too directly, is that also, because in, in the model, you really write down the reason, the, the way you sort of can uh, rationalize. Um, uh, wealth inequality. One way to rationalize wealth inequality in the in the OG model you work with is to have uh, income inequality, and so you sort of have this direct channel from income inequality to wealth inequality. But no, no. So there, there is very little. I think in the models there are very little correlation between those two things, wealth inequality and income inequality. Which also in the data is very low correlation between those two statistics, and that's also true in the model. So. Income inequality, just that income risk removes people from the very bottom, mm. so from the close to the borrowing constraint. We get them removed, so they're not no longer credit constrained, but still it has very little impact on the overall wealth inequality in the model. So mm. those two statistics are very equally related, okay. so two completely separate, uh, yeah, yeah. Completely okay. separate right. factors. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, um, another uh, point I want to make is that Maybe some key, so we're trying to now, so the focus of the summary papers is to sort of think about, okay, are there some distinct uh, factors uh, or some factors that define the Nordics that can uh, help us or like guide us in thinking about whether fiscal multipliers are large or small in the Nordics? I, here are, ah, oh, this is hard, hard to read, so I can tell you. I thought that there are possibly other factors that are just as important, at least in my mind, to th when I think about whether the Nordics have large or small fiscal multipliers. Uh, these are just illustrations that I found on the web that sort of corresponded to my priors. But so the first one here is a heat map or like a color map of, of the of Europe that shows in red the countries with the highest household debt as percentage of GDP. So one thing that really characterizes the, the Nordics is that households have a lot of debt. So we end up with a lot of wealthy hand-to-mouth households. It, it, it sort of, it feels like some of the same mechanism that you, you uh, I think I'm always right the mechanism. Uh, yeah, and, sure. and, but, I, uh, but I, I would think that that would maybe be one uh, important reason to expect possibly large multipliers in the Nordics. That, that will, uh, yeah. exactly, it will reinforce further the mechanisms mm -hmm. that they have put on the table. Right? So yeah. if you have wealthy handsome mouths and you have even more credit constraint consumers and you have even... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Another oh. fact that you also were talking about, this map is on the trade union densities, where again the Nordics are characterized by having fairly high union densities. Uh, this is sort of a reminder also that the labor market in the... I, I'm no expert on labor markets across countries, but at least the labor market that I know in Norway is not the labor market where I would expect labor supply variations to be what drives sort of the multiplier effect. I would, uh, I don't see it as sort of a, a realistic description, or at least not, that's not the story I would bring to the Ministry of Finance to explain them why, why uh, raising government spending next year would stimulate GDP that <coughs> higher. If uh, because uh, if we say in a balanced budget stimuli, uh, raise spending and low and increase tax at the same time, uh, those closer credit constraints would sort of feel poorer and work more, and that would stimulate the economy. I would rather think it goes through these high debt households and high MPC mechanisms. So 
So I, it makes me sort of wonder if we're really trying to con put the models into context for the Nordics, but maybe he is relying a lot on, on labor supply, on intensive labor supply, uh, is is uh, a bit off. Uh, so Wait, no, may I ask you just to stand here for those online? Oh yeah, sorry. To see you better. Yeah, and so the, the, the rightmost picture is on on. Uh, I, uh, this is probably the the most uh, speculative chart, but it's on on uh, the quality of pension systems, and that's just a reminder that that the Nordics are also characterized by fairly good public pension systems. I uh, suspect that that should also matter a lot for whether sort of whether or how to measure wealth inequality and, and whether whether there's a need or how how life uh, a households or an individual's perception of, of a household of lifetime wealth is affected by changes in taxes. Uh, the government takes care of a lot of your savings, so so there's sort of less of a need to to worry too much about the future in the Nordics, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final question is, is a little bit related to the comment from Paul. So I'm, uh, the one thing that I know is a lot, there's a lot of focus on in the macro literature in, and also then in Norway because of the good micro level data, is this uh, uh, micro level estimates of NPCs. So here I'm re really just questioning uh, or throwing out the question. I don't have no, I don't, I don't know the literature well enough to really uh, say how you should do it, or maybe you have done so already. But there is uh, convincing uh, micro level studies on on uh, uh, NPCs being surprisingly high for for uh, at least for modest to to somewhat large uh, transfers uh, based uh, on say the lottery winning studies, etc. Um, so that the lottery's uh, winning, one lottery's winning studies at least is Fagring et al. Um, and then in Oclair et al, they, they argue that as long as you have that these intertemporal emphases, that they are sufficient statistics for calculating free scale multipliers. Uh, so this seems like a very like relevant literature. Uh, and I have really no clue how to connect that literature to. to right, uh, right, so I guess the, the other side. So. Um... The, the consumers that here are credit constrained, they will have high MPCs. As they, if they get income today, they will consume a lot of that income. But at the same time, they will, uh, if you transfer, they will re reduce reduce their labor supply. Actually, <laughs> um, so so that that's two sides of the same thing: the propensity to consume and propensity to work. Uh, and uh, the same consumers have a high propensity to consume and uh, high propensity to work. Um, then, uh, but um, I guess also the effective study here was the effect on output, right? So I guess uh, output has to, in, the, in all these models, uh, output has to be produced with capital and labor. So to get the higher output, you need the uh, labor supply to, <laughs> to increase. Uh, and so the question is, uh, by how much labor supply increases? So in none of these macro models, you will get any uh, GDP change without a change in, uh, in labor supply. That is part of the production function, right? And so, yeah, unless yeah. you have sort of involuntary unemployment and people that, uh, yeah. where I'll get demand, actually. Yeah. I think we'll have to take some of the oh, yeah. comments. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure. Yes, for the uh, yes, second yes. comments yeah. as well. Fine, no, but that's... Um, no, please. Yeah, no, but the fine. So I think, like, all in all, uh, should we expect large or small fiscal multipliers in Norway? Well. I think uh, Hans's paper is a nice overview of, of selected research on fiscal multipliers, but I'm asking sort of, is it too narrow by that? I mean, there are other theoretical explanations that could also give you, um, um, uh, or other theoretical explanations for why you have fiscal multipliers. So, so uh, I guess that's what I mean by too narrow. Um, I would welcome a stronger link between real world fiscal policy and fiscal experiments. By that, I mean, since the link between inequality and and the size of the multipliers hinges a lot on exactly how you define the real world, not define the fiscal experiment. It would be nice to to know more about how how that could play out if you move away from lump sum taxation, for instance. Um, yeah, are there other models that could be um, that could explain some of the same empirical evidence and and many other important dimensions characterizing the Nordics that also could affect multipliers. It would be nice to see a somewhat broader discussion of that in the paper that tries to sort of put this literature into context for the Nordics. Thank you.
And now we're going to have Joa Juntela, our co-editor, um, yes. as well as co discussant for, for your paper. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to Joko for the invitation to serve as a co-editor for the forthcoming uh, issue of, of Nordic Economic Policy Review. I must say that uh, if this were to be a kind of a standard academic <laughs> journal, we as our editors would have deep troubles already now because the comments have been so good. They, they can be as papers by themselves. So I'm happy that we have this kind of interactive system probably going on that the comment data will be commenting again, the revised versions. So the workload for the editors is going to be smaller. <laughs> I hope very much that it's going to be the case. And then the second invitation was uh, from Yoko to uh, discuss this paper by Hans and, and Anna. That is a really nice paper. And I was happy to uh, find out that he had some difficulties in finding the discussion for this because he's, he's concentrating on the wealth, wealth things. And I'm at the moment, I'm, I'm a Professor of Finance and Economics at the University of Bolton. So this is something that I really love. I, I like to combine finance and, and macro uh, together. Okay, I will be fairly brief. I have some comments <coughs> and I have designed my presentation in a way that should perhaps uh, help you in producing the final paper because this is a nice paper. This is pretty much a finished version of the paper. I have no major comments. Like Antti, for example, had a theoretical comment for two papers, for the Finnish paper and Swedish paper together. So, so I have not that kind of things uh, for you, but I have something here. So as already thought uh, mentioned, this is a paper that draws together a set of papers by, by Hans and his uh, co-authors that have analyzed this role of income and wealth distribution as the determinants of fiscal multipliers. And then based on these findings, he sort of draws the conclusion for the Nordic cases. And the main conclusions are based on the fact that there's lots of wealth in inequality in Nordic countries, but not much income inequality in the Nordic countries. And that's sort of a general point in the, in the whole paper. So main outcomes are that the fiscal multipliers vary a lot over time and space. Countries with high wealth and income inequality have larger fiscal multipliers, and multiplier is increasing in the spending shock. And the expansion or contraction of common man spending results to larger or smaller, smaller multipliers. And like Tord already highlighted here, one of the key things is the intertemporal substitution of labor. Perhaps in terms of the main results that you are reporting here. You could perhaps highlight a bit more uh, these, uh, these main results in light of the current discussion of strong need for fiscal consolidation, i.e. reduction of debt in the Nordic countries. It's easy to do for you. Yeah. Just <laughs> draw the figures on the debt ratios or something like that. Yeah. You can bring that to, to the more kind of up-to-date yeah. discussions, because these are not the most recent observations. For example, we think that we are in deep troubles in, also in that sense that we have really, really bad debt ratio. And uh, then the key results for the Nordic countries is that we have this high wealth inequality and low uh, uh, income inequality. And uh, we expect large impacts from programs that increase consumers' current income and smaller impact, impacts from uh, the ones that increase the future income. And then oh, I have a type of there. So, so there's a big difference between the multiplier values for the Nordic countries and compared to the European countries, the whole sample where I think that the range was from 1.20 to 1.77 or something like that. So it's clearly a big difference in terms of percentage uh, differences. Okay, so uh, all your points are uh, in this paper are based on these three papers that are using a bit kind of a different framework in each case. So you are using a bit different assumptions for the optimizing behavior and so on. So you get a bit different results in, in each case, but basically the main result holds there that the, uh, 
for example, in the most recent paper, the fiscal multiplier is increasing in the spending shock. And uh, this holds true across time, countries, and types of shocks. So it's kind of a robust result. It's not dependent on the, what kind of shock you have there. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good, it's a solid finding. We can report them uh, uh, confidently. My main questions are related to the uh, reporting of your results, mostly. I have a suggestion that you perhaps could do something more, not to reframe your theoretical models or anything like that, or the papers uh, that you are have been using already, because they are sort of established research already that you have done already. The most interesting table for me is this table three, where you have this income and wealth inequality reported based on the countries. And it really gives a clear picture that the Nordic countries are, are very different compared to, to anything. I have some questions. First of all, I'm really <laughs> interested about the time variation in the variables. Is there a lot of time variation in the inequality measures, especially for the wealth inequality? That is the one that I'm mostly interested in. Yeah. It's because it's about investment behavior of the households. Are you always discussing about finance or is it something else? So, so the, 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 Are you always discussing about financial wealth in all the cases or is it something else? Yes. Is it including household uh, or the uh, apartments, housing wealth? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, have, a, to, you have to clarify that yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. A, there's a big difference if you yeah, include the housing wealth. Also. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, the results might change quite a lot, actually. The other thing is that when you talk about these wealth methods, uh, do you have a cross financial wealth there analyzed? And how does it develop, develop compared to the net financial wealth? So are you at all interested about the indebtedness of the household supply? Talk was actually mentioning already that here. Because once again, in, the, in Finland, especially this might change the whole brain completely. Net wealth is something that is really, really interesting at the moment, and whether you include the housing wealth there or not, it's a completely different situation. So, uh, is there a role for controlling the share of housing market wealth in the overall cross wealth? And in that case, is there a role for the mortgage debt housing wealth? And then the final thing here that actually might be a kind of a theme for your next paper. Is there any role for the level of the government debt or the debt ratio when you're discussing about risk and consolidation? And this is based on a couple of uh, very recent academic papers that come from the borderline of finance and <laughs> economics literature that I'm really interested in following. So basically, I have this paper from Journal International Money and Finance, and one is published in Macroeconomic Dynamics, Economic Policy, and one is actually from your page, you, where you have most of your publications in Journal of Monetary Economics. So, and these are all papers that are you have not mentioned in the references, but they are considering these kind of discussions, whether the debt ratio has, or the level of debt, government debt has a role to be there. How big? are the fiscal multipliers when you consider the differences between the debt ratios. Yeah. That's, that's one of the key things. And these extracts come from the most recent paper by Emine Doe and others in general of international money and finance. And they find out that it's really essential to uh, extract the cross-section of when you have a panel data countries. You have to extract the cross-sectional variation in the debt ratios and also the time series variation. And you can use the debt ratio uh, threshold values extracted from the cross-sectional variation and alternatively from the time series variation as the values to divide the countries to the high debt countries and low debt countries and do the analysis differently for those. They are using smooth transition models actually to do this things and uh, they also use uh, instrumental variables, variables estimations to do this empirically. But sort of a, one of the things that you might want to add to your, if you want to include any kind of discussions that 
your results might be sensitive to the debt level. Yeah, uh, so I, I can say the, the, the cross country studies uh, include government debt. Um, yeah. And also, I think also we know from my first paper, uh, we know the effect, at least we know one effect of debt is that. So more debt, the real interest rate is higher. So if you yeah. get like a, a current income shock, the value of the current income shock is higher. And it's like you get a larger shock because the future incomes matter less when the interest rate is higher. And also the future income shocks is then relatively smaller and the real interest rate is yeah, higher. Yeah, so okay. that's one that is one mechanism. Yeah, but okay. like, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, I understand. But this does, these kind of figures sort of raise my interest in terms of a Philly second yeah, yeah. because we, yeah. we have a bad country there. So, so, so it's really interesting to us, especially. So they have these kind of results. Uh, I will probably include this table to my report that I'm supposed yes. to include yes, to yes, the yes. Uh, forthcoming issue. Yes. That sort of gives an idea about the role of these step levels. Yes. If you divide the data based on the development over time mm. and development cross-sectionally. So, because the cross-sectional variation is the thing that is really interesting, and we have lots of cross-sectional variation in Nordic countries yeah. in the debt ratios at the moment. Mm. So, so oh, yeah. Nor Norway should be a case of negative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But basically, this is sort of a highlighting the fact that perhaps it's really when you are discussing about the factors that have an role. Yeah. Like Todd actually was also raising here that. Are, is this the relevant set of factors that have an effect on fiscal multipliers? Perhaps you should consider that also. Yeah. You can write the next paper for or yeah. something other uh, that Sorry. considers also this. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank Are we you in time? Thank you so much. We will now take a 10 minute break, or I guess, uh, no, 15 minute break. Uh, before we have our final, uh, last but not least, uh, Sweden. Uh, we will hear from Marcus, and we have a Swedish commentator here in the room, and we will have our, our final commentator online. Hopefully, smooth sailing. Uh, so with that, let me hand over to you, Marcus Gugunius. Welcome. Oh, yes, you got it. Thank you. OK, thank you for having me here. I hope you still have a little bit of energy left for the final presentation. Yeah. And I will talk about the development of the size of the automatic fiscal stabilizer in Sweden in the last 25 years. And I will focus on three questions. Uh, is it possible to increase incentives to work without decreasing the size of the stabilizers? How are the stabilizers affected by the COVID pandemic? Mm. And how are they affected by the recent inflation spike. And um, uh, I find that uh, during this time period, there was a slight decrease in the size of the automatic stabilizers, mainly in the first half of the period, and they are currently slightly less than um, 0 0.5. Uh, there has been uh, a number of sizable reforms in Sweden during this period to increase the incentives to work. And uh, given the size of these reforms and the only slight decrease in the stabilizers, uh, I conclude that, uh, yes, it is possible to uh, make work pay without impairing the stabilizers. Uh, the stabilizers are determined by the uh, long run uh, tax and transfer system in a country. And during the pandemic, there was a lot of discretionary and temporary support. And since it's, since it's temporary, it doesn't have any long-term effect. And hence, the, the stabilizers were unaffected by the pandemic. <coughs> and, uh, if the stabilizers were allowed to operate freely, they, had, they would have transferred approximately 110 billion Swedish krona to houses and firms. And finally, uh, the current inflation is assessed, is assessed uh, to not affect the size of the stabilizers. So this is the agenda for the talk. And uh, this article is based upon a working paper that is jointly written by Johan Almeberg and me. And we used uh, an OECD method from 2005, same as, the, as in Finland, as the paper, paper Jenny presented. 
where the budget elasticity represents automatic stabilizers, and the GDT gap is the measure of the business cycle. Uh, and this is a disaggregate, it's, it's estimated with a disaggregated approach, where we have a structural part and a structural part. And it shows how disposable income is, stab is stabilized and not necessarily consumption investments. Uh, and uh, one important <coughs> aspect when we talk about stabilizers is that uh, the construction of the fiscal framework is important as well. Can public sector let the budget's budget balance vary? And I will briefly touch upon this in the end. Uh, the budget elasticity, <coughs> alpha, uh, consists of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a five different elasticities that are summed up. It's four tax elasticities, uh, weighted with a tax, tax share of GDP, and one uh, expenditure elasticity, weighted with the uh, expenditure as share of G GDP. And the revenue elasticities, as well as of the expenditure elasticities, uh, consists of a structural part and a cyclical part. And the cyclical part is estimated with the time series regressions, and uh, the structural part is um, is where we look at the, the different um, tax structure for each year. And the four elasticities for revenues is direct tax on labor, it's payroll taxes, corporate income taxes, and indirect taxes. And uh, one important measurement when, when doing these calculations is the labor cost share. Uh, and the, in this case, we use the broad <laughs> definition of the labor cost share. It's all output that is not allocated to firms as gross profits. And both direct tax on labor and payroll tax use the labor, labor cost share as their tax base. Uh, and the tax base for the corporate income tax is the, the part of the GDP that is not uh, the labor cost. Uh, and looking at the data, we see that uh, the labor cost share has been uh, around 70% of GDP uh, since the uh, 1980s. And we follow a cross country analysis from OSD and use. 72% of GDP for Sweden. Uh, however, during the last couple of years, we had a COVID-19 pandemic, as you are all aware of, and there was a lot of discretionary support during the pandemic, amounted to 330 billion Swedish krona, approximately 5 or 6% of GDP. And in the calculations, we, had, we adjust for this discretionary support, because we want to capture the, the automatic response from the business cycle on the, in these estimates, and not the discretionary support. Uh, when we do the time series regression, uh, we end in 2019, before the pandemic, and we disregard the temporary tax cuts and increase in unemployment insurance and uh, add these numbers to that, uh, back for a um, uh, for respective year. And also, a lot of the support increased the tax basis, both, mm. both for the households and for the, for the firms. So we adjust the, the tax base with, a, say, with, with that amount, as well as how that change in the tax base should affect the, the taxes as well. So let's jump straight forward to the results. Um. The elasticity of the labor cost share with respect to the GDP gap uh, is estimated with a regression about, which shows the change in the labor cost share as part of potential GDP. And that's explained with a change in the output gap. GDP gap. Uh, and um, the regression shows, shows that it's been uh, 
uh, slightly above 0 0.8 during this this period. <laughs> and that's the, that's the first pivotal <coughs> part when we estimate these tax elasticities. And then we have the, the structural part where we look at the uh, the tax system for each different year. And for each year, we have 800 different income levels, which we calculate the marginal and average tax for. And the income, income levels are from 1% of the median income up to eight times the median, median income. And we have this data distribution from Statistics Sweden for the year 2016. And we use the same distribution each year, but it's scaled with each year's median wage. And then the elastic elasticity is calculated as, an, as a, a weighted average, where we have the marginal tax divided by the average tax. And the marginal and average tax is also weighted with the income level, as well as how common that income level is. And that's the, the F there. That's the, the weight that we're that we using. Uh, and then we see that uh, both the average marginal tax rate, the, which is the blue line, has decreased during the period, uh, as well as the average, average tax, tax rate. And uh, the average, the decrease in the average tax, tax rate has been larger which implies that the elasticity has increased. And that's a gray area here. And the biggest jump in the change of elasticity was in 2007, when an earned income tax credit was uh, introduced in Sweden. Uh, and I will say that uh, Later on, we will uh, multiply this gray elasticity with the 0.83, that is the cyclical part estimated before, and that will give the uh, elasticity for the direct ta taxes on labor, which would, which would then be weighted with the GDP share. Uh, the second tax is the elasticity between payroll tax and labor cost. The payroll tax in Sweden are proportional to wages. So if your wage increase by 10%, the payroll tax increase by 10%. And hence the elasticity is one. And uh, this structural elasticity is then multiplied with, with the cyclical elasticity by the, by the tax base. The labor cost uh, is affected by the GDP debt, previously estimated to 0.83. And this means that uh, by construction of, of this method, uh, this uh, elasticity for the payroll tax is uh, constant throughout the periods. However, we could have shifts in, um, in the GDP share of the, of the payroll tax. But we will see in the end that they are marginal. Uh, the elasticity between corporate income tax and GDP debt it depends on two elasticities, between the corporate tax and the corporate profits, uh, which is also a constant tax in Sweden. So the um, elasticity is one. And between the GDP gap and the corporate profits. And uh, since, uh, since, since corporate profits is the other part of GDP that is not um, and the wages, uh, we can use this clever little, little formula here to plug in the uh, elasticity estimated to uh, the, uh, the elasticity between labor cost share and the GDP gap estimated at 0 0.83 and the profit share uh, 0 0.28, that is 100 minus 72. And that is that the elasticity between, between the corporate income tax and the GDP gap is 1.45. So this is also constant throughout the entire period by construction of the method. Uh, 
the final tax elasticity is between indirect taxes and GDP gap. And the indirect taxes are VST and excise taxes, tax on households, capital income. And it's difficult to assess how these taxes are affected by the GDP gap. So in line with uh, the OECD method, it's assumed the elasticity is assumed to be one. And uh, these taxes are mainly proportional uh, so the elasticity between the tax and the tax base is also one. Uh, so the, the final elasticity for this tax is one. And uh, if we summarize this tax elasticity, as I hope you can see the numbers, we have uh, um, we have two columns here for the direct tax on labor. We first have the cyclical uh, part, 0 0.83, multiplied by the uh, multiplied by the structural part in the second column, and this gives the third column. Uh, and that shows that uh, the elasticity from direct taxes on labor has increased from 1.04 in 1998 to 1.25 in 2022. Uh, and the remaining three elasticities are constant by construction. Yeah, um, they are constant as well as the, the, the cyclical elasticity. But as mentioned earlier, the GDP shares can vary over time. The final elasticity to, to estimate is the, is the one between primary expenditures and the GDP gap. And in, uh, in these calculations, uh, it's assumed that it's only the uh, unemployment related transfers that are affected by the GDP gap. Uh, I have done some robustness tests where I also included other social transfers. Uh, how the unemployment gap relates to the GDP gap is estimated with the following regression, where we have the change in the output gap, unemployment uh, minus divided by the unemployment divided by the equilibrium unemployment. Uh, these numbers are in log, and they and that's explained with the GDP gap. And using data from 1982 to 2019. Is an elasticity of minus six and change. And, and then there's an elasticity between primary expenditures and unemployment gap. And that's the net expenditures of unemployment related transfers. Uh, because in Sweden, Sweden uh, unemployment insurance is, is taxable. Uh, so part of the transfers returns to the public sector. Uh, and that's calculated according to the following formula, uh, where the first part is the uh, net of taxes, and I use the median, and I, I, I use the average tax for the medium income. Uh, and it's the second part is the uh, the share of primary expenditures that are unemployment insurance related, and then it's corrected with the unemployment gap. And using the, it's, this is also a bit difficult to see, I realize. But using, uh, using the data here gives that uh, uh, the second elasticity has decreased from 2.5 down to 0 0.94, whereas the cyclical elasticity is constant. And that is that the total elasticity from um, from the expenditure side has changed from, from minus 0 0.15 down to minus 0 0.06. Um, and that has, yeah. Just on the, on the unemployment, yeah. the effect from uh, the OK coefficients, 
the link between the outlook app and, and the appointment. Isn't it sounds so large? What how much does the output gap in your data vary over the sample? Uh, What's the large negative output gap in the sample? So I guess that the, the largest one should be you know, during the financial crisis. Uh, I don't know how large it is actually, to be honest. But is, the, is, is this to be interpreted that the minus, the output gap of minus one gives an unemployment rate of 6% higher than normal? Six percentage points are in normal? Well, not, not, not six percentage points, no. So if the unemployment rate in Sweden is seven percent, yeah, and then you have an output gap of minus one percent, yeah, it increases by um, six times seven is zero point four. Okay, from, from seven to seven point four. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's more reasonable, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, and then these five elasticities are weighted with the GDP share. And we see that uh, the corporate income tax is fairly stable. Uh, payroll tax, indirect tax, also fairly stable. Uh, direct tax on labor as a downward trend. That's a part of the make work pay when you have decreased the uh, taxes on labor. And the primary expenditures are uh, Jumping a little bit more, but there's a slight decrease as well. Uh, this data shown, shown here in the graph is the official data from Statistics Sweden. So I haven't made any adjustments here yet. If you look during the COVID period, uh, primary expenditure as share of GDP was relatively high. Uh, when I adjust the data, it's slightly smaller. So it's uh, uh, cut in half, approximately. And uh, here's, a, here's one slide where weight elasticity is for direct tax on labor and primary expenditures. Because that's the two components where there's some action in the period. And uh, for direct tax on labor, the elasticity increases, but the GDP shares decreases. Uh, but the overall contribution to the automatic stabilizers is a decrease from 0 0.18 to 0 0.13. Uh, for the primary expenditures, uh, the, the effects grows in the same direction. The elasticity decreases, the GDP de share decreases slightly, and the contribution therefore decreases from 0 0.08 to 0 0.03. So the, the change are equally large for the direct taxes on labor, as well as the primary expenditures. Uh, and then adding all these uh, five columns together, the gives automatic stabilizers in the end. And it shows that they were uh, slightly above 0 0.5 in 1998. And these days they are slightly smaller than 0 0.5. Okay. So the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, it's possible to, to make, make work pay more without impairing the automatic stabilizers too much at least. In the, in the working paper I mentioned earlier, we do a couple of extensions. Uh, in the estimates presented here, it's assumed that uh, during the business cycle, all persons, all, all workers increase their um, the labor supply equally over the business cycle. And it's an effect that is in the intensity margin. Those who work, work slightly more or slightly less. Uh, however, it's, it's reasonable, reasonable to believe that it's mainly the lower part of the income distribution that is affected by the business cycle, such as uh, construction workers. Uh, if we focus only on the lower part of the income distribution, say those having a wage up to the, to the medium wage, it is that we have slightly lower stabilized in the beginning of the period and slightly higher in the end. 
uh, consider if you if you look at the at the trend during the period, it's then virtually zero. So the stabilizers are the same, 1998 as 2022. Uh, we also look at what happens at the extensive margin. During the business cycle, people move in and out of unemployment. And that's one cause for the, uh, for the change in the, in, the, in the labor cost share and, and, and the wage sum. Uh, but in Sweden, we have an earned income tax credit that creates a tax shield for unemployed. After they've been unemployed and then they start to work again, they will have pay lower taxes. Uh, considering this effect, but we assume that the action comes from people being unemployed for three months and then um, moving back into, into employment. Uh, we find that the stabilizers are slightly lower in the end of the period, but they are unaffected in the beginning of the period. It was during that time, Sweden didn't have any earned income tax credit. Uh, and then we also do four robustness tests, tests and conclude that uh, uh, the estimates presented here are fairly stable to different assumptions. So what can be said of uh, the stabilizers uh, in time of crisis? Uh, well, let us look at the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the soaring inflation during the last years. As in many countries, Sweden had a lot of discretionary policy. Uh, we had a furlough scheme uh, where workers could uh, work less hours and um, uh, the state covered part of their income. Uh, payroll taxes were temporary, temporarily decreased. Uh, the unemployment insurance was increased. And there, there was a plenty of direct support to firms, as well as different, as well as many other support schemes. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we conclude that the stabilizers were unaffected by the pandemic. Uh, because the, the size of the stabilizers is determined by the long term rule and regulations and then not discretionary support. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I try to adjust for that in the, in the calculations. Uh, uh, the stabilizers would have transferred approximately 110 billion Swedish kroner to households and firms during the pandemic if they were to operate freely. However, uh, they were in part replaced by discretionary policy. Uh, policies that aim to keep, uh, uh, keep people safe and retain the labor market matches, such as a furlough scheme and a direct support to, to firms, uh, meant that the uh, unemployment didn't have to increase as would otherwise have been expected, and the wage sum didn't decrease as it would have usually done in a downturn. Uh, therefore, also, the link between the output gap and the usual effect on the public sector through automa automatic stabilizers were temporarily broken. Uh, this raises some important questions. How important are uh, the automated, automatic stabilizers today? Uh, if you want to conduct fiscal stabilization, uh, discretionary fiscal stabilization, it should be timely, temporary, and targeted, TTT. And conventional wisdom is that it's very hard to accomplish, and therefore you need to have relatively large automatic stabilizers. Uh, however, uh, the pandemic showed, at least, at least for Sweden, that discretionary policy can work well. Uh, the support was put in place, <laughs> Uh, just weeks after the, the outbursts of uh, COVID-19 in Sweden. Uh, it was temporary, it was aimed specifically on, uh, uh, on the labor market and uh, maintaining the matches. Uh, so the need for automatic stabilizers 
might be exaggerated. And finally, uh, what kind of inflation from, from the last years teaches about automatic stabilizers? Uh, well, but in Sweden, we have, we have had a tightening monetary policy and re a recession is coming and uh, already here to some extent. And we've had a fairly moderate fiscal stance. But inflation affects the stabilizers with a lag. Part of the tax system and welfare systems are automatically adjusted. Uh, but these, estimates, these adjustments had not, had not yet occurred for 2022. So it's not captured in the numbers that, that I showed earlier. Uh, however, I do a qualitative assessment about this. And uh, higher inflation has meant that the profit share in Sweden has increased. It was a real wages hadn't, hadn't uh, catch up with inflation. Uh, and an increased profit shares, share means higher stabilizers, uh, because it, it has a higher elasticity than uh, direct taxes on, on labor. Uh, moreover, the unemployment insurance decreases as a share of GDP. Uh, and that means that the stabilizers are somewhat smaller. Uh, but uh, we judge the effects to be similar in size and cancel out. But we haven't done any actual calculation. It's, we will do that in a, in a couple of years when we have the, the data for it. Uh, however, as I mentioned in the beginning, the fiscal framework is also important when you look at the destabilizes. It's not just the budget elasticity. Uh, and one important question is if uh, the public sector can uh, let the budget vary over the business cycle, or if they adjust the consumption. And for the, for the general government, they can uh, have, let the budget balance vary. Uh, but it's a, little, it's a little bit different for the municipalities in Sweden. Uh, their main source of uh, Funding is income from tax and wages and the support from the central government. And these, are, these two are not automatically adjustments for the inflation. Uh, so their, their funding decreases as share of GDP, whereas their expenditures to a large extent follow the inflation rate and increases. So there's a risk that municipalities will decrease consumption during the downturn. Uh, however, there was a new system put in place a decade ago that allowed municipalities to smooth consumption over the business cycle. Uh, this system has, hasn't really been put to a test yet, but uh, it will be now for the coming year, 2023, 2024. And if this, this uh, system works, uh, it means that uh, the decline in the in the budget elasticity that I showed earlier is partly offset by, the, by this improvement in the fiscal framework. And that's what I had to say. <laughs> Here's just a, a summary of uh, uh, the things that I started with. Questions for Marcus? Uh, you asked some during, so maybe we. No good. All right. Thank you so much, Marcus. Then we will uh, move to our discussions for this paper. And first, um, we have Erik Höglin uh, from the Swedish Ministry of Finance. And it all looks good. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment on on Marcus' paper on automatic stabilizers. It's an important topic, uh, uh, of course. Uh, uh, many believe that this is probably the most, the traditional view is that this is the most important part of fiscal policy stabilization of the, of the 
the, the business uh, cycle. So it's it's important to accurately measure these things. Uh, I will talk about uh, automatic stabilizers and, and ways of improving them uh, without uh, hampering long-term <laughs> growth. Uh, and then I will talk about measuring structural net lending, which is sort of the uh, other side of the coin uh, here. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about COVID-19 and, uh, and inflation finally. So uh, uh, Marcus highlights this uh, trade-off, uh, potential trade-off between having uh, high automatic stabilizers that reduce volatility of GDP and employment. Uh, but that could be uh, Having high automatic stabilizers is often uh, the case that you have uh, high government expenditures and uh, thus high taxes and, uh, that may impair growth in the in the long term. So the question is then: Is this trade-off unavoidable? And, and Segunis points to 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 the empirical evidence showing that even though uh, labor taxes have been reduced uh, significantly in Sweden during the last decade. Uh, automatic stabilizers uh, have not come down so much. Uh, but I will talk about other, maybe perhaps more direct uh, ways to circumvent this, this trade-off. Uh, um, that's semi-automatic stabilizers. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, accurately defined, actually, but the point is that you can increase automatic stabilizer by increasing the size of the public sector. That's one uh, way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to have systems that vary directly with the business cycle. So this for, could, for instance, be business cycle dependent unemployment insurance. That doesn't mean that the unemployment insurance system is more generous uh, over time in, on average, but more generous in downturns and less generous in in, in booms, uh, that could put them, that would increase the automatic stabilizers without uh, reducing incentives to work. So actually, you can argue that it will increase incentives to work in the business uh, Another way is, is to have active labor market policy that vary vary uh, with the business cycle. Uh, that I think is is. Uh, something you you want to do you can do that more uh, more explicitly and then in sweden it's also the marcus mentioned these grants to local governments uh, i do not have high hopes on these consumption smoothing mechanisms for municipalities uh, i think municipalities themselves claim that they need support in order to to not uh, reduce uh, uh, employment in the local governments next year. Uh, so the system works. Uh, the municipalities have two sources of income, basically, as Marcus mentioned. Uh, the revenue from, from wage, taxing wage income, uh, and uh, grants from the central governments. And this grants to central governments are, are nominally fixed. So you need discretionary decisions to, to, to increase them. Uh, and one potential problem with this is, is a timing problem. It's difficult for the local governments to, to plan if they don't know if they would get this discretionary crisis in, 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 in central government grants to local governments. And then that, that could be a problem because they have to make their own budgets uh, and, and plan employment in the respective municipality for the next year before knowing how much money they have. So, so this is actually potentially a pretty large uh, impairment to automatic stabilizers that the local governments may act pro-cyclical. Uh, in practice, this has worked pretty well. Government has uh, put in place discretionary spending uh, of large amounts in the financial crisis and also in the COVID-19 crisis. But I think, in, in, uh, as a system, it, it, it could be, it could work work better. Uh, so this 
from a policy perspective, I think uh, increasing uh, automatic stabilizers by something like those examples I've mentioned uh, in this slide is, is something yeah, that you could, could consider. Uh, my next point is, is about measuring structural net lending. In, in Sweden's fiscal framework, the structural balance or structural net lending is the most important statistic. The, the, the so-called surplus target it says that the uh, uh, that the overall government net lending should be one third percent of the of GDP over the business cycle. But the the operative uh, target is the structural net lending, which should be approximately one third percent of GDP in in, in normal times and, and 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 probably lower in, in downturns and higher in in, in booms. So then it becomes important how you measure structural net lending. And, and, and Marcus paper is actually measuring structural net lending indirectly. So what he does is he's measuring this uh, gamma parameter in the first equation here. And uh, this method was traditionally used in the Ministry for Finance uh, to calculate structural net lending with an estimate from, from OECD. And one problem with this uh, type of measurement is that you uh, treat all uh, business cycles alike. And we know that business cycle vary and how the composition of GDP changes over the business cycle is not identical from, from recession to recession. <laughs> So the, the point of this, this method is to, we know that actual net lending is varying with the, with, the, with the output gap. And then we use this factor to sort of neutralize that and when we have a structure of net lending. But in practice, this method will, I would argue, mean that structural net lending uh, will uh, vary with the output gap uh, also if you adjust for any discretionary measures. Uh, and that's a bit problematic in, in, in when we're uh, trying to implement uh, and, and, and use a fiscal framework that is really that where, where structural net lending is really important. So the current method that we use in the Ministry of Finance tries to, 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 to address this to some extent. So we calculate structural balance in, in the other equation here. And, and there are seven uh, tax bases, and this is sort of the implicit tax rate. Uh, this is the share of, of GDP, that's potential GDP. And then you have unemployment insurance benefits. And G uh, naught here is, is uh, other primary uh, expenditures. And R times D is the uh, net capital income. Uh, and the problem with this method is uh, not the same, but it produces the same uh, problematic results, namely that the structural balance will vary with the output gap. And in this method, I think the reason for, for that uh, result is that we don't have any good measures of the structural uh, in, tax base share of GDP, at least not for all tax bases. And so in practice, we use a uh, Hodrick Prescott filter for this one and a pretty smooth one, which means that uh, um, the structural tax base as a share of GDP tend to vary with the output gap and produces structural net lending uh, estimates that also vary with the the output gap. So the point here is that I will would encourage further developments of these methods <laughs> to, 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 to be able to, to, to handle also uh, these uh, challenges. So uh, going forward to, to COVID-19, uh, what can you say about COVID-19? Uh, I think uh, Marcus said a lot of, of, of good things. Uh, first, you have to point out that that was not a common downturn, uh, and probably stimulus of private, private consumption was not uh, ideal. 
So it, it, it may be beneficial that, that automatic stabilizers do not operate freely in, in such, a, in such a, a downturn. Uh, I think I understand uh, why Marcus claims that they did not operate freely, but I think we could make it more clear in the paper. I think the presentation was much more clear than the paper actually on this point. Um, and how can you interpret the, the policy response of uh, in COVID-19? I would say that the main lesson from uh, this uh, fiscal policy response to the pandemic was exactly that what Marcus said, namely that that implementation lags and decision lags can be very short if needed. Uh, and that makes automatic stabilizers less important as a policy tool. And uh, it's difficult to, to, uh, to know, of course, in the future, uh, if, if business cycles uh, will be more alike or, or, or not. I think from my career, we've had the, the, the financial crisis and then the, the Euro area crisis and then the COVID-19 pandemic and now the surge in in inflation in some terms also a crisis and, and I think they are, are, are very different and, and probably call for different fiscal policy response. I think that's, I, I, I mean, there's one one benefit of fiscal policy compared to monetary policy is it's, it's more, uh, it's uh, easier to, to target uh, the, the actual <laughs> crisis that we are in. The fiscal policy has a lot more instruments than monetary policy typically. Uh, so that's one thing to, to, to think about going forward, that maybe uh, the, the sort of trade-off between automatic stabilizers and, and discretionary policy is, is not uh, necessarily as it used to be. Um, I will say something short also about inflation. Uh, I will not say anything about supply shocks. I was planning to, but uh, <laughs> uh, I will not. Uh, so I understand that uh, uh, Marcus' conjecture is that overall inflation has small effects on automatic stabilizers. Uh, but from a practical perspective, when we study this in, in, in the ministry, it, it, it's it's pretty complicated dynamics within the inflation cycle. Uh, and Marcus mentions uh, uh, this also in the paper, but I think you could, could uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, the composition of GDP changes over the cycle, and, and then we have the system, system uh, related lags uh, in some taxes and, and, and benefits. And then there are also nominal features in, in different parts of benefit systems, uh, as well as in, 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 in systems for, for, for other uh, primary income, uh, primary expenditure. So I will encourage Marcus to, to, to dig a little bit deeper into this uh, for, for the final version. Uh, overall, uh, I think this is a, 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 a nice uh, contribution. Um, um, a good paper, and I, I have enjoyed reading it. And I was talking. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we now have our final discussant, Paul Harmanbay, uh, who is joining us online. And we are actually running early, so I hope he's here and has been listening in. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Uh, I'm a, should I ask him to share or can you spotlight him just so we would, see you? Yeah, we yeah. see you now. Great. Would you prefer to share, Carl, or I can just yes. get you to the next slide, otherwise I can um, I can do it for you. Uh, I could share and it even says I am sharing. sharing. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So let me just pull up. Yes, not that, okay. not that I can see you guys particularly well, but still, now I see you a little bit. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so, uh, I mean, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to discuss this, this paper. And as a Swede that moved from Denmark to work in Norway, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, very happy to be part of this Nordic uh, conference. Okay. So, um, oh, yes, there we go. Will you so, tilt your camera down a little so we see you a little more? We were seeing a lot of your, uh, just, uh, thank you. Yes. Something like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So overall, so I'll take a little bit of a step back, summarize the paper. Uh, what's the size of automatic stabilizers? Around 0.5. It's moving around a little bit, but 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 ballpark there. Uh, and as Marcus explained very well, what does this number 0.5 mean? Uh, if GDP increases by 100. Then the fiscal balance increases by. <laughs> okay. And goes without saying that the question that Marcus is asking and is successfully addressing is not about the efficiency of these stabilizers. It's not what they do with the economy once you have sent this money out to, to, to the world, right? So so there are other dimensions of fiscal stabilization, like, for example, targeting households who may spend directly or spend later and so on. So heterogeneity and marginal propensity to consume. This is outside of the scope of the paper. This paper has a narrow and very clear uh, task, which uh, Marcus successfully ad addresses. And the framework and this the framework is that you decompose the fiscal balance into its components. So the share of GDP uh, for the respective revenue sources, and then computer elasticities. Um, with with uh, and then there's this two tier thing where where you first compute the elasticity of the tax base, and then you go and look up sort of in the microdata what the marginal tax rates are uh, concretely. Okay. Um, so. My overall assessment is this is careful work on an important topic. And, and for me, which is, you know, coming a little bit outside of the literature, it's a very well written paper. You know, because every time I had a question, it was answered in the text. Okay. So that that that's very, very, very nice. You know, sometimes you know you need to read other papers to figure out the paper you're reading. Not the case with this one. Okay. So well done. Uh, the rest of my discussion, I want to make. I want to discuss two things. Okay. So the first one is, is the punchline of the paper, which is that the, maybe there's no trade off between making work pay and automatic stabilizers. And the second one is a concrete way, which I think maybe this paper could uh, embrace heterogeneity at, at very low cost, so to speak. And, I, and I'll be clear, clear about that. Um, so, the tension between make work pay and 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 automatic stabilizers. Let's write down a very very simple model, where you have one household. You can imagine multiple, but let's say one, with low utility of consumption and disutility of labor, and they have. A budget constraint, which is that the consumption they get is the wage times the hours they work. And then the tax and transfer system is doing something with that and spits out disposable income. If and the way I think about it is that in the long run, you, you choose your hours. And if you solve this very simple exercise, with log utility and consumption, you get that hours worked depends on really the progressivity of the tax system. Okay, so on the top here we have the marginal one minus the marginal tax rate, and in the bottom here we have uh, one minus the average uh, tax rate. Okay, so we have this very clear implication of the simple model that the progressive, progressivity of the tax and transfer system is what de determines labor supply. Now, take this model and this little household and say that labor supply is fixed in the short run. 
and that a shock to the economy makes the wage go up or down. What happens to the disposable income and thus consumption of this uh, household? Well, a little bit of algebra says that the elasticity of disposable income to GDP is the same elasticity. So if you want to stabilize the household's disposable income, you want a low elasticity. But if you want uh, but if you want a high labor supply, then you want a low, uh, a high elasticity. Okay. So, starting from a very, very simple model, and of course, too simple. Automatic, automatic stabilization is, at a first pass, inversely related to incentives to work. So, the only thing I'm doing here is sort of, sort of providing the background for, for Marcus's uh, work. So, with that background and with the results of Marcus uh, present, there's an interesting interpretation of recent Swedish history that, that uh, Marcus provides. How did automatic stabilizers remain roughly constant while taxes were being substantially lowered? Well, the tax system became more progressive. So, quote, the findings show that it's possible to increase the incentives to work without impairment of the automatic stabilizers. And I find Marcus's work fairly convincing, uh, but that opens sort of the question, how does it all fit together? You know, the story goes, of course, that there's a high labor supply elasticity among poor workers. They're particularly responsive to incentives. That's true. But flip side of that is that these guys also have a high exposure to the business cycle. <laughs> uh, so that so these are just high elasticity guys, both with respect to labor supply and with respect with respect to the business cycle. Okay. And I'm going to show you a graph on that. So it makes me wonder, in light of this, like how much did the incentives to work change? Uh, and of course, that's beyond the scope of, 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 of this paper, but 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 it's making this very provocative, in a sense, finding uh, that it's possible to increase incentives to work without impairment of the automatic stabilizer. Making that all fit together is, is something that I find very interesting. And I wrote down the simplest model imagine, imaginable. There, it doesn't work. And I'm curious if you, if, if, if you could do something in a more realistic or quantitative macroeconomic model, uh, exploring the tension between the incentives to work and automatic stabilizers. Okay. So this is like an interesting question I think that Marcus is, 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 is uh, raising. The second thing I, I, I wanted to say, and again, I mean, Marcus, whenever I thought I had like a good comment on his uh, paper, I read the next, <laughs> I, I read the next page and, and, and he explains what I was uh, planning to comment uh, beautifully, okay? But Marcus points out that they, they make this very natural assumption, which is that, that um, <laughs> when labor costs increase, so GDP goes up well, by 1%, that transmits into 0.83% increase in labor costs. And then they say, let's, let's assume that that's a proportional increase in the wage of all workers. Of course, Marcus knows that that's not true. I know that that's not quite true, but it's a very useful starting point. Uh, and why is it not true? Because some are moving in and out of unemployment, and in particular, lower paid workers may respond more strongly to the business cycle. Okay. And as input to that, there are there is recent work on the US and Germany Maybe in particular, Germany is relevant, and John Kramer here, I should say, is uh, working at the University of Copenhagen, which runs a very natural regression, which is the change in the log, the, well, the growth rate in income or log income for different populations as a function of the change in overall GDP. So you 
in particular, low-income work workers, high-income workers. And this beta here is capturing sort of the exposure of a subpopulation to the business cycle. So when GDP goes up by 1%, how does this very subgroup, how does their income respond? In an average sense, of course. Uh, and what Kramer finds for Germany and Guggenheim and Adam for US is that workers which are earning a little are a lot more responsive to the business cycle, their earnings, than uh, workers who, who are earning uh, well, above the median. Okay? So the way to read this graph is that you divide the population into quantiles, groups of uh, 20 or 5, maybe 10, 20, yeah based on the recent earnings, the past five-year earnings. And then you see what happens, you know, how does their income growth co-move with the business cycle? On average, it should be around one, and that's true for the median and up, the German data. But for the bottom quarter of the population, it's the sensitivity to the business cycle is much higher. So loosely, poor workers are three times more exposed to the business cycle. And one tiny, tiny suggestion is that in Marcus's methodology, these numbers could be plugged in as sort of weighting the different earnings uh, quintiles. Okay? Uh, and it's not a difficult regression to run, uh, and, and it would be nice if someone had run it for uh, Sweden Denmark, Finland, Iceland, and Norway. I, I, I should also, also mention here that, that there's a bunch of papers which have run related uh, regressions recently, where they have monetary policy shocks on the right-hand side, and then income growth. Uh, but this is sort of unconditional regression, which fits beautifully with, with uh, Marcus's framework, uh, as far as I know, has not been uh, estimated in the Nordics. So, to summarize, I mean, I think this is a careful and well-written paper. Uh, I found I found it thought-provoking, uh, in particular, sort of this trade-off between labor supply incentives and automatic stabilization. And as both uh, both of the presentations before me highlighted, there's much more in the paper. For example, an analysis of COVID-19 policies. But I thought I'd I'd stick to these uh, two basic basic points. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carl. That was our final presentation. Now, I just wanted to ask Yuka or Yuha if you wanted to say a few words. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Oh. We can stop the sharing, maybe. Or maybe that's you, Carl, if you stop sharing, because I'm not sharing. There we go. OK. <laughs> but now we see you very large, Carl, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, Don't it's, do anything there. It's been an interesting day. So uh, a lot of very interesting papers uh, going to the uh, Nordic experience in fiscal fiscal stabilization. So uh, uh, the way ahead is, is that uh, we need to have the uh, discussion writing their report somewhere in, in January. Yeah. Yeah. It's earlier than that, but we can get back to them. Yeah. So, uh, so let me just thank uh, all the authors, discussants for excellent job, um, and uh, hope to hear from you also in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Actually, thanks, <laughs> thanks to Amika and Anna. Of course, of yeah. course. <laughs> Always sign of a good meeting when you end early. So I'm granting you uh, almost 25 minutes of extra time in your day in Reykjavik or at home. So thanks for everyone who joined us online. And uh, yes, all of you who are joining me on the Northern Lights tour, I hope you got the email. Otherwise, let me know. Thank you.